Today, I'm delighted to be chatting to the lovely Sarah and Lindsay from internal communications agency, Brilliant Inc. Now, Brilliant Inc. call their account management team strategists. So Sarah is head of strategy and Lindsay is head of operations. Lindsay and Sarah, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Honestly, it's such a pleasure to have you here. So thank you for taking the time. Would you mind, first of all, both of you, just explaining what your roles are at Brilliant Inc.? So, Lindsay, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, I'll go first. So I am head of operations, as you mentioned. I've been at Brilliant Inc. for five and a half years, which is very exciting. Um, and I was actually the first project manager ever hired at Brilliant Inc., um, which was an amazing opportunity at the time. I had the chance to build something that didn't exist from scratch and provide some support to Sarah and her team, which was really cool. So now I am on the leadership team and I oversee all of the back of the house operational functions. So people operations, technical operations, financial operations, as well as our project management office, our PMO. So it's delightful to be here. Thank you for amazing. having us. Honestly, your experience, it's, I'm just going to be ready to fire loads of questions at you. So that is incredible. <laughs> um, Sarah, what about you? Yeah, so I have fewer jobs than Lindsay, which is pretty easy. Um, so I am the head of strategy. I've been with Brilliant Inc. for about eight years. So I can, um, as we get into this conversation, I can talk to you a little bit about life before Lindsay and all the work that she did and then life after Lindsay, which was significantly better. But I lead all our team of internal communicators um, as they produce all of our client work and make our clients happy. Incredible. And I'm actually going to go straight there, actually, Sarah, because I'm okay. really, there are a lot of um, agency owners listening to this who are deciding whether they are going to have effectively an account management team and a project management team. And it's something Lindsay alluded to the last time we spoke, you know, I'll have to explain the history of why we separated the roles. So would you together tell the story of originally what the kind of evolution of your business model has been? Lindsay, do you want me to talk a little bit about life before you? And okay. Yeah. So great. So it was dark. It was a sad time. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it was, we were a smaller agency. And so like many agencies, we were doing everything. Our team of internal communicators, which were a version of a strategist, were doing really three jobs. We were doing project management as best as we could. We were doing account management in the best way we could. And I'm also really focused on delivering client work. So we do internal communications work. Of course, we work with creatives and designers and videographers and people who are generating um, some of those things. But our team of strategists is really responsible for doing the content development, helping advise clients on the strategy, all the billable work. And so we were doing this account management and project management on the side. So it wasn't even a hybrid role. It was really three different roles. And as you might imagine, it's tricky, right? It's tricky to balance all of those hats because they come from very different perspectives. If you have your agency uh, management or account management hat on, you're thinking about growth and long-term success and keeping your client really happy and anticipating what they might need next. And that doesn't always lend itself well to delivering your work on time and on budget. <laughs> and um, so it was really difficult to sort of balance all of those priorities. But we were doing it. You know, we were a much smaller team, like I said, and we had fewer accounts that we were managing. And so we were okay. When I came on, I had spent maybe six months of project management. So I had a little bit, I introduced Brilliant Inc. to Smartsheet, which we love so much. And, um, but that was sort of where my skill set ended. And mm -hmm. that was the best I could do. And Lindsay, I'll let you take it from there. Sarah, I don't think I knew, I just learned something. I don't think I knew that you are the smart sheet originator yes. into the business. That's really fascinating because boy, do we, I mean, this is not a smart sheet promotion. We're not paid by them by any stretch, <laughs> but we love it now. We use it a lot. Dashboards are the buzzword in 2023. Everyone's getting a very visual dashboard nowadays. Oh, how fun. Good for you, Sarah. Well done, Sarah. Well done, you. <laughs> Thank you so much. 
That no. was my project we'll, management we'll have, contribution. We'll, hi, we'll have to dive into <laughs> dashboards a little bit later because that there's I was gonna of say that have picked up on that. <laughs> so yeah, you know, it's really interesting when I think back to how things started and Sarah's hat visual is really helpful because I think that when I joined the team. Some people gave me their project management hat with open arms. And it was a, thank goodness you're here. I would love to not do three jobs anymore. And some people held on to their hats a little bit more closely. And it kind of felt like something was maybe being taken away or they weren't really sure the impetus of it. And so I think that's something I think a lot about as maybe agency owners or leadership are wondering how this transformation could take place and what might the reactions be of people to bring on a new function like this. Those were the two different reactions I would say people fell into one or the other of that. And that was really interesting um, to think back to how we kind of navigated that and dealt with those different reactions, if that makes sense. Can I pause you there? Because I've had this yeah. conversation just recently with an agency that has absolutely gone through that. That, And so I would be interested to see how you did navigate those two scenarios. Yeah, I mean, the one was easy. The people who just gave me their hat, it was lovely and took it and ran with it and kind of developed project plans and timelines and processes right along with them. Others who maybe were a little bit more resistant or maybe enjoyed the project management work and enjoyed um, using three different parts of their brain to do three different jobs. It was just more of a, let's figure out how to do this together. I think the, the nice part about our business is that we have a variety of clients and we have a variety of project work. And so we were able to customize the approach to project management based on how things were already set up. So some, it was a little bit heavier handed, others was a little bit lighter with a longer lead time and both ended up working really, really well. It was a matter of just getting in there, showing how we could work together, showing how PMs can make um, strategist lives easier and can be true partners throughout it versus, you know, taking something away. It's additive. Okay. So actually there might be agencies listening that think, right, we're ready to do this. Um, but we've got these existing clients that have been used to having an account manager only doing everything. How do we introduce the concept of saying, actually, there's going to be two people working on your account? How do you sell that to the client? Yeah, I can speak to that. So, um, and it comes up from time to time. Um, even still, you know, it was something that we talked about in the early days of Lindsay building the PMO and joining the team. But <laughs> still can come up from time to time and it's funny it seems like the the clients who may need project managers the most may have the most questions about project management support which is probably no surprise to anyone but when we talk about how we support our clients we say that we support you as a team um, we don't want our clients to only have one person and only have one person's brain that they can leverage and so we bring in experts it's very similar because our work is internal communication. It covers a lot of different things, all the way from recruiting, all the way through exit and retirement and all the touch points in between. And that has huge variability in the work that we're doing. And often we pull in SMEs. We pull in people who really understand diversity, equity, and inclusion. We pull in people who understand intranets. We understand, we pull in you know, people who better understand some of the technical aspects of working in internal communications. And it's very similar to project managers. I always kind of joke, like, trust me, you don't want the creatives to manage the timeline. Everyone laughs, <laughs> right. and then we just move right on. And it's, it's fine. If we do get pressed on it, we just say, look, a project manager's whole job is to make sure that we're on time, on budget, they are extremely efficient with their time and will make sure that no one is over servicing or over billing your account. And that has really addressed any concern that's come up. Great, mm -hmm. great. So Lindsay, I'm an account manager. You've just arrived at Brilliant Inc. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, oh, I don't know if I'm, I want to let anything go because what if it all falls through the cracks? What would you expect me to pass over to you from what I was doing as a hybrid account manager? What are the things that you are going to take on that are going to alleviate me? 
Yeah. I mean, I thinking about the things that might be most attractive to that account manager is handling scope changes or requests. So I think the easiest thing to do um, is provide that clarity of roles and responsibilities with the client boundaries, really. Of This is who you go to for this type of request, and this is who you go to for that. So having the project manager handle budget conversations, um, is this in scope? Is this not in scope? Can you do this by X date? Can you not? That's like where I think the division starts. And I think Sarah's nodding. So I think it's one of the more attractive pieces of it as well. Uh, the account manager, the strategist continues to be the person that wows and says yes and does all this great work. And then you hand over maybe what might be perceived as some of the harder or more administrative conversations about scope, timing, and budget to the project manager to deal with that. It's a nice division that provides clarity and also alleviates some of the pressure of well, I want to deliver this great piece, but I don't know if I can do it in the time that they wanted. And it it provides those like two different paths to go down, if that makes sense. It does, absolutely. So you've both obviously seen, before we get into the nitty gritty of how you work together on a project and we get a bit granular, I'd love for you both to know, because you've been with the, with the agency so long, you've seen this big change. What has been the overall impact of splitting the roles on the mm -hmm. business and the staff? Um. We have been extremely more profitable and been able to expand <laughs> um, so many more accounts thanks to our project managers. I mean, so that's first and foremost for me. And when I, I hopefully Lindsay agrees, I was one of the people in the camp of, yes, please help, please come, <laughs> come manage these things yes. for me. Yes, you um, are. Keep an eye on these things because um, for me, it is, no greater gift than for me to come up with an idea that will help our client and for my project manager to go, Sarah, you know, that's out of scope. Let's do a change order and bring in some more money for that. Right. Okay. That's a huge gift and a huge benefit to the agency, to my own success, to helping our clients. And there were many times where I just wouldn't think of it. And, and to be honest and completely vulnerable about why, it was because of a lack of confidence in my own work that I deserve to ask for more for this effort mm -hmm. is sometimes a hard concept when you're in the weeds and you want to make your clients happy. And we, within internal communications, you know, we, I wouldn't say we're a mission driven organization, but we care very deeply for the people that we're supporting the employees at the end of the line who are getting these communications. And so sometimes it can feel a little bit tricky to then say, well, we'd love to do this for you, but we need to process a change order and expand our contract, expand our timeline, expand our work. In the past, I would just do extra stuff for free mm -hmm. within the timeline that was already set. None of that makes any sense. And none of that sort of um, builds any clout with the client either. So for me, um, throughout my career at Brilliant Inc., that's been the hugest benefit. And just so you don't feel alone, Sarah, that is very common, okay? And sure. it, it, it's actually the premise behind why David Baker started also looking at disk profiling, okay? Because there's mm. he noticed since 2008, since he's developed over 22,000 profiles of agency people, that there was this definite pattern with account management roles. You know, that particular profile wants they're good at the client relationship and yep. of course what you've just described is 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 totally understandable because it is jarring it is tricky no one wants to kind of break that rapport by having this really serious conversation so it, it's totally normal um so it's brilliant i think any agency owner listening will think well yeah more profitable and expanding accounts it's just a win-win yeah so okay so what about from your perspective, Lindsay, you obviously were in the weeds, you you had some resistance, but eventually you've you've created your own team and it's working like clockwork now. But what for you, have you seen anything else that's been um, good for the agency? I wonder, as I was listening to Sarah's response, because I also was going to say more profitable, I was also wondering about um, I don't want to say eliminating, but reducing um, burnout and stress across the team as well. I think that's been really huge, just having more support 
as Sarah mentioned earlier, not having single individuals um, working with clients, but having a team of people who are supporting together. I think some of the non-monetary, I guess, benefits is having another thought partner on a call that's living, um, breathing, <laughs> paying attention, and knows our business as well as the strategist does to bounce ideas off of. I heard this. What did you think? That sounded like a risk to me. Did you hear that too? This one was an opportunity. And having that team, um, I think, is a huge benefit um, that works across all of our accounts. I also think with adding project management as a function to the agency came a lot of tools and processes. And so having at the leadership level now the type of visibility we have into capacity across the agency um, and the way that we look at forecasting um, into the future, what are our staffing needs going to be? Do we need to ramp up or down? That was immensely helpful two years ago when we saw a really big spike in growth to kind of understand what type of resources are we going to need um, and how quickly um, and what type of new skill sets are we going to need? We just have a lot more visibility into that and able to make proactive decisions. It's spot on. I can see that that makes total sense. With the tools and processes you refer to, are you happy to share the tools that perhaps you were using initially on and maybe you've evolved those tools or systems that you're using? Do you use any kind of project management tools specifically that you would recommend or not recommend? Yeah, I think it is so tricky because I think there are so many great tools out there and now there's a lot of customizing that you can do to kind of make it work um, for you. As Sarah mentioned, we're using Smartsheet, but that's more of the timeline, visualizing of data, that type of tool for us. So we don't have one single tool that is the, you know, golden ticket. Um, we use a tool that is actually now owned by Smartsheet called Resource Management, um, and we've been with them for years now. And from a time tracking perspective, it's great information. And from a forecasting perspective, when used uh, properly, provides a lot of really good data and information as well. But we also um, try to stay flexible with what our clients want and how we are. We just try to stay agile and we use other tools as well. So our uh, stack of tools is probably larger than maybe some might think is efficient, but it works for us given our business. We have some people that just love Trello. They think it's beautiful because it is and it's easy to use. Um, and so some folks use that. And we we leave that up to project teams to kind of lean on different tools based on you know, what's available and what's going to make it the easiest with our clients. Sounds great. Rather than force feeding like one tool to everybody and making them all use it. Exactly. So can I add to that? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, I'll just add that part of the reason it's so smart to be, have, have access to so many tools is that many of our clients, not all, we work with HR folks, we work with business unit leaders, we work with a lot of different people, but uh, most of our clients are internal communicators. And they love when we help organize their own work. So not only mm. are our project managers helping to keep our projects on time and on budget, um, and managing our contracts and managing our vendors and doing all of these really important things, but they're also helping our clients often organize their work and their workflows. And so part of the reason why we need to have access to so many tools and be really proficient in them, I'm saying we, but our project managers need to be really <laughs> proficient in them, is because often we'll get those requests from our clients. They might say, gosh, we really need an intake process. We're getting so many mm -hmm. requests from our own business partners, and we need a tool, we need a process to be able to capture those things. We, of course, want to give our agency insight into that, but we need help to manage it on our own. And our project managers will come in and do that billable work for our clients as well to help organize their work, help make their lives better and more efficient. And sometimes that might be in Trello, sometimes that might be in Smartsheet, could be in a lot of different tools. But that's been a really huge benefit as well. Our project management is not only behind the scenes, it, they are often mm -hmm. doing billable work for our clients. Um, and sometimes those project management deliverables really are um, deliverables in our SOWs. So mm -hmm. that's part of the reason as well. 
What a great idea to actually package that up and sell it to clients as a service. You know, you've, yep. become, you've mm-hmm. become so proficient with it yourselves that you're now offering it to your clients. I love it. So would you mind both sort of talking me through the actual kind of dance between uh, a strategist and a project manager at the beginning, from the beginning of the project when you've just closed the deal and talk talk to me about that process of them working together through the through the life of a client um, project, or if it's a retainer, the li- the life of the relationship. Yeah. Do you want me to start? Yeah. We'll see what I say, and then you can correct it. Um, cool. So <laughs> you know, I think I think part of the benefit of having project managers. And our hybrid, which is an account manager and um, someone delivering billable work, is that we're getting different perspectives. So within that, you are getting, you can, two people can be on a call with a client and hear slightly different things. You can have different takeaways, you can have different perspectives. And through really open communication, which we're always trying to encourage on our team, you might have some healthy debate. And that's the point. Um, We want our teams to have discussion, have debate, um, sort of figure out the best path, incorporating all of these uh, points of view and being really inclusive of different perspectives in the room. And so I think, you know, we always, Lindsay and I joke that we, gosh, we just, we wish our teams would fight more. And we don't really mean fight (laughs) more, but but we definitely (laughs) want to encourage that healthy debate, that discussion to make sure our decisions, our plans, our paths forwards are very well-rounded. So that comes to mind first. Lindsay, do you wanna share anything on that? Yeah, what you were saying about having like multiple people listening and hearing different perspectives just made me think of how at the beginning, the two roles work so closely around stakeholder management and understanding what the different people within the project team might want and need and starting to anticipate those. You know, sometimes folks will say something that we're like, okay, this person is going to want a lot of written communication from us as it relates to project status. So what does that look like? Let's start thinking about a weekly status update, a weekly roundup at the end of the week that lets them know this is what we did, this is what we're looking for. Or someone else might want that higher level view. And that's when we're like, okay, we want something visual, a dashboard that they can check in on, that they get the full picture. And so I think at the beginning, that's a lot of what the project manager is thinking of and partnering with the account manager on is who are these individuals? How are we going to be able to best work with them? And how can we kind of customize our collective approach to do that through communication and visualizing information? Very clever. And that is done at the kickoff call, is it? When you're meeting the stakeholders, are you referring to client stakeholders or just the whole team stakeholders? I was referring to client stakeholders specifically, yeah. Uh, th- I think that is just such a gem of a of a recommendation, actually. And because this is what it's all about, isn't it? We're not in the mass market business. We are a consultancy business working with really a handful of clients, you know, 25, 30 clients maximum. And actually, why wouldn't we have a slightly different view and bespoke approach to the client management? So that's a really good tip. Okay, so so talk me through the process. You've just won the deal and the the account manager and the project manager are being lined up to kind of take over the relationship. Yep. So Jenny, this is something we're continuing to refine um, and we'll continue <laughs> to probably till the end of time. Um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, so we've won the business. We're putting our team together. We have a very cross-functional team that decides who is staffing accounts um, so that we can make sure we're not overloading anyone. We're making sure that we're distributing work in a smart way, that people's skill sets are being used appropriately, but they also get development opportunities. So we're weighing all of those things in those staffing decisions. We actually have meetings every Monday, Monday to talk about the work coming in, the work that's ready to launch, and make sure we're making the right decisions. We also allow our teams to raise their hand for projects that they might be interested in. We have a really cool process that Lindsay um, created. Do you want to talk about I Need an Inky? Oh, yeah. So our, our, 
our company's name is Brilliant Ink. We refer to our people as Inkies. And so the process is I need an Inky and it's, we use Slack heavily. We use Slack and it's a Slack channel where uh, our sales team is able to post new opportunities that are coming in and kind of put out a request for who's interested, who has the background, who has the skill set, and people can raise their hand right in the channel and let them know what their experience is and what their interest is, and then put their hat in the ring, really, to be considered for that opportunity. Um, that's been in place for probably, what, 18 months, maybe two years now, um, yep. and it's been really transformative to... Uh, communicate out what's coming and what's available and give people flexibility to um, have a little bit more say in the type of work that comes across their plate. Wow. And do you find there's a mixture of people that want different things? You don't get the, oh, we know this is going to be a popular project, put it up and it gets snapped up. Yeah, I can speak to that. Yeah. So um, yeah. it's something that we often find, look, our, our strategists often have a quite full plate. And so they might be a little strategic about what they raise their hand for, um, knowing the time commitment as well. I think that one of the more interesting aspects of it is designers and the projects that they may or may not take on. Uh, we have a brilliant team of designers who are so talented, but depending on what's going on with their clients, they might say, look, I really want to be on a retainer type project. I want some regular cadence. Or they might say, nope, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want to be on regular status calls. I want one-off projects. So whenever those come up, I'm going to raise my hand for those. And so we've learned a lot about our team, our team of employees and our team of extended um, folks that we work with as well about what they might like, what might be of interest to them. Um, but the brilliance of it is that while we're aware of it and we track it because we want everyone that works with Brilliant Inc. to have a really good experience, we also don't have to carry all that knowledge and be the sole keepers of it, right? Mm -hmm. They're able to raise their hand. They're say, yep, this works for me now. Mm -hmm. And their needs are going to change over time. We have a lot of working parents. And so over the summer, they may have more or less time. And so that allows them to really raise their hand for the type of work that they want in that moment. And it's been really successful. It's added also a lot of uh, transparency to our work, um, to our processes. So people don't feel like they're being talked to sort of behind the scenes in the dark about being right. selected for something. It just has brought some of our processes into the light, which I think has been really helpful for everyone's sort of understanding of how things are working and, and what's coming up. I, I mean, this is totally you lot, really, because I love working with you. I, you know, I, I, uh, we have worked together and the autonomy and transparency, I don't think I've met any other agency that has this level of engagement throughout the whole team. So the way you manage everything, I think a lot of people could learn some lessons from that. So that's a brilliant idea. I love that thought. So, okay. So the, the team have been assigned. Keep going. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. The team have been assigned, they put up their hand and said, I want to work on that one. And they've assigned, do you assign a, an account manager, sorry, a strategist and a project manager for every project, retainer or project by project? Typically. Every there project. Are, yeah. Well, I would Very say few. there's like Very two few. exceptions right yeah. now. Yes. But they're on our risk register and we are watching them. Um, <laughs> yes, they are. Teeny, That's right. <laughs> teeny tiny budgets. <laughs> We're doing a couple of workshops with some clients um, where they've asked us to come in and host a workshop for their team about one's about DEI, one's about um, data visualization. And so those, we have really skilled teams running those who know this material inside and out. And so we haven't assigned a project manager to those, but that's the only exception. And with the next workshop, we might change our mind and put a project manager back on. But yes, so we always, except for those, assign a project manager. We always have a strategist on our projects. Um, they're the sort of scale of how much account management versus content creation and strategy development they're doing can depend. Because we have such a strong um, design and creative team, some of our projects are primarily creative based. We're doing internal branding for our clients, things like that. And so our strategists might have a really light lift in terms of the deliverables that they're actually producing, but their focus would then be on account management and helping support the PM, partner with them and work with our design folks as well. So it depends. That's the sort of the tricky answer in terms of how we who we staff on projects and what the configuration is. Um, but there's always a PM, there's always a strategist. And then the rest we sort of figure out depending on the work itself and the client's needs. 
Great. And um, Lindsay, perhaps you could speak to, you know, at the scoping stage, because I know you're sort of head of that, aren't you? If, you know, you win a deal, you close a deal, and then it comes down to developing the contract, which you call a scope of work, you ensure that your project manager and the strategist input on that. Is that right? Yeah. So we have um, a step in our process that I don't think we ever skip. I'm, I'm pausing for a moment to make sure that's a true statement. And it's called our proposal to SOW process or, or a statement of work. And that is the first time that the sales team and myself and likely the project manager, as you mentioned, um, and the account manager are going to sit down and look and see this is exactly what was pitched. This is what was proposed. This is what the client wants. Now let's turn that into a contract that we can follow and we can manage to. And it's that first opportunity for the people who are going to be leading and driving the work forward to understand what we're all agreeing to and get on the same page. Um, we implemented that process probably four years ago now. And I feel like that was one of the first game changers of making sure that um, folks had clear expectations on what we were delivering at the very beginning. And so that step never skipped. Always a meeting. I just had one this morning for 30 minutes. And I'm always um, a little bit surprised when something new comes up that we want to add to out of scope or assumptions or dependencies. But once you get those people talking, you really start to think ahead and you start to think about risks. As Sarah mentioned, we are starting to track risks um, so much more closely now and talking about them a lot more openly, not just at the project level, also the account level, also at the agency level to be more proactive about what might happen and, and think about those things and get them in writing so that it's clear, not just for our internal team, but for the um, you know engagement that we're getting into with our clients so that everyone's on the same page. So yes. And that's another benefit, actually, like you said before, about having a few people working on the account and watching right. the different types of risks. Because when you're on your own, you've got a million and one things to think about. And that kind of goes to the back burner, doesn't it? Okay. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay. So they've been assigned, they've worked on the scope, the proposal to scope um, of work. Mm -hmm. They've inputted, said, hang on a minute, what's out of scope? Have we made these assumptions? And really what you're doing there, which I think is really super clever, is that they are assuming the responsibility at that stage, aren't they? It's like they you give them the the opportunity to input so that they can feel some ownership from that point. For sure. And then, and then what's the, the next step? How do we assign kind of roles and responsibilities? Who's going to, who's going to manage the, the client? Like, are we both going to be on the status calls? Um, how do you work out the kind of the nuts and bolts of the, particularly the client contact? Yeah. So again, this is all subject to change. We might evolve this at some point. Um, we were listening to <laughs> the other account manager and project manager podcast episode that you had, Jenny, and they had a really interesting um, process. What happens for us right now is that we go through the sales process, we go through the P to SOW meeting where we take that brilliant proposal and actually turn it into contractual terms that everyone can agree to. Then we move into an internal kickoff. Um, so that's just with the brilliant team that's pulling together anyone who maybe hadn't been assigned to the project by the time we did the P to SOW meeting, pulling everyone together and talking through roles and responsibilities. We talk through client history, what we know about them. A huge amount of our work is through relationships that we already have, either expanded work or a client that we've worked with somewhere else that has gone to a new company that we followed along. Um, so we tend to have a good history to talk through and we wanna make sure that everyone on the project team understands that history, understands how to work best with this client, with the stakeholders that are at play, any politics on the background, anything that might be going on. So we talk through all of that. And like I said, then we go through um, a pretty robust process of talking through roles and responsibilities. Um, and that gets into, we're going to have this SME join the project. They're going to be on two calls with the client, but we want to make sure we're incorporating their perspective. But the bulk of the discussion is around, you know, what is the strategist doing? How many strategists do we have on it? Do we have two? Mm -hmm. Do we have one? How are we dividing up responsibilities between those folks? 
And then what is the project manager's responsibilities as it relates to this project specifically? Project managers sometimes scale their support up and down. Lindsay talked about that before as it's appropriate for the project. Um, and with strategists, we do a similar thing, but typically it's around, do we have one person or two? If it's a smaller project with a really defined scope where everyone's sort of on the same page and makes a lot of sense, then we might just have one strategist. If we have a huge retainer and we know there's some really big deliverables coming up and it's going to be too much volume for one strategist to handle, then we might bring in a second. The second is typically responsible for developing a lot of the content. And then what we typically call the lead strategist, they are a little bit more focused on the account development and account management um, tasks. And so we'll talk through all of that. And again, it's all subject to change. So as we go on through the life of the project, we might say, we need a little different support from the project manager. Mm -hmm. We need a little different support from our SME or our strategist, depending on what we've learned and how the project's evolved. Like I said earlier, Project managers have benefited Brilliant Inc. tremendously in our ability to do change orders and expand mm -hmm. our agreements and what we're doing with them. But the nature of that, of course, it brings in more revenue for the agency, which is awesome, but it also changes the work, right? And so then mm -hmm. we need to sort of rethink, okay, so now we're adding six months to this timeline. We are adding new stakeholders. We're adding new responsibilities. And so how does our team need to shift and change? So all of that gets talked through as much as we know in the internal kickoff. And then mm -hmm. we revisit that as we need. Amazing. And I think Go on, Lindsay. to add to that, if I may, so everything she was discussing just there is very detailed. And so while those conversations are happening, what we're doing in the background is configuring our systems to match that. So we've identified that one person is going to be the lead, one person is going to support, and SME is going to come in later in the project. All of those things start to form the sequence of events, the timeline, and when different resources are going to be allocated to the work itself. So while the team is getting wrapping their arms around that piece of it, we're also configuring the tools so that that feeds into our forecasting that I mentioned earlier. So we can start seeing, okay, our research lead needs to be here at this time. They're also on these five projects at this time. And we can start seeing if conflicts are going to exist, if capacity is going to get tight, it all feeds into that larger system. That's really clever. So and, and another reason why you want a dedicated project management team who's all over this, because mm -hmm. trying to make sure that everyone is being, you know, utilized in the right way, not overloading people to see if they're too, they've got too much capacity. Just as you said, if all the systems are working in unison, then you have all of a sudden a very efficient, well-oiled machine. Now, both of you have referred to SMEs. I just wanted to make sure everybody listening to this understands that that's a subject matter expert so you're pulling right. in subject matter experts which could vary depending on the nature of the project okay carry on you've assigned roles and responsibilities you've had the internal kickoff and then what happens yep then we're normally waiting on the paperwork being signed and as soon as we get to celebrate that in slack which we do loudly um, with lots of emojis, then we move into an external kickoff. So that is with the client. We have a beautiful template that we use, but of course customized because we can't help ourselves, nor would we limit ourselves to um, <laughs> depending on that one template. Um, but then we do an external kickoff. And so we pull the full team together with our client, with important stakeholders and talk through everything that we know about the project, everything we've heard so far, reconfirm their priorities, reconfirm um, what's happening with them within their own company and their own political environment, um, and then make some next steps and some plans for how we're going to get started. That's where we might confirm how often we're going to meet with the client. Um, we might confirm our assumption about the type of reporting they might like to see. We confirm what our first priorities are and how we're going to be able to tackle those. Um, and it's a conversation, right? We would be foolish to think that nothing has changed from the time that we agreed on a proposal to when we kicked off with the client. Sometimes that can be a couple weeks. Sometimes it can be a month or two, depending on procurement and how quickly people can get the paperwork processed. But that gap in time can be a space where a lot of change happens. 
Um, different things can happen within the client. And so we want to be really responsive. We want to make sure we're double checking our assumptions and that we have a really good plan in place um, going forward. So it's an external kickoff that we have with the client to confirm all that and sort of then hit the ground running from there. And our project managers help make sure that anything our strategists have rambled off because it made sense in the moment that we're actually able to deliver on it. And that's part of the challenge of our project managers, right? Is strategists are brilliant. Our team is so skilled and we suffer from ideas. We have ideas and ideas and ideas about how we can help our clients, how they can do really great work for their team, how they can deliver for employees. And without our project manager sort of keeping it together, documenting it, making sure it's in scope, um, we would be in some trouble. So that's what happens. We do an external kickoff. <laughs> Fantastic. Anything to add there, Lindsay? Yeah, you know, Sarah um, said a couple of times very casually, and I love how um, this is so ingrained in her process and in her brain now, but something I'm thinking about other agency leaders might have picked up on is that we don't start work until paperwork is signed. And I don't want to breeze over that because that is something that I think was another game changer years ago that we stopped doing. I mean, project managers are basically brilliant, um, beautiful boundary setters is what they're really doing. And I know it's tempting. I know when you sell something, you're excited, you have a lot of energy, you just want to dive in and get started. And as she mentioned, that process from when they say yes to the proposal, to when their procurement team is able to give us a contract that we can execute, it can be weeks, it can be upwards of months at times. And that's a really kind of like painful period. But that gap in time is where we saw the over budget start. That's where we saw the over servicing. It was at the very beginning. It was reviewing things beforehand, having conversations beforehand. And in my opinion, it just used to set off the relationship, um, just not on a very clear footing, if that makes sense. And because we don't do that now, even if folks really are anxious, I think they tend to respect the fact that we need to make sure everything's in place before we dive in. And that's something we started doing years ago that now we clearly don't look back on, um, but I think it's really important. Um, I think the other thing culturally that has shifted in our own language when talking about project management work is change orders. I've heard other project managers or folks that work in agencies think of change orders as almost a dirty word, that it's something that's a sign of like, we did something wrong and we need a change order. And that is not the case at all. And it's because of everything else we've already talked about. It's because of how diligent we are with setting up the contract and turning that proposal into a contract that we can execute with really clear expectations. The change order comes not because we mismanaged time or budget or worked on things that were out of scope. It's the exact opposite of that. It's coming because we are providing great service to our clients and they want more. And we all know that it's not part of this contract. It's just very clear. And the change order is the tool in which we are able to expand that work. Um, and it's a very positive experience. And so I just, in case it's still a dirty word for others listening, I wanna work on changing that. I, I think the two points you've made are very apt. And I remember that you shared, I mean, when we met, we met at David Baker's Mind Your Own Business Conference. Mm -hmm. And you were telling me that you were networking with other agency owners and having this discussion. And you were quite surprised because of your, you know, your way of working is we're not gonna start working until we have that PO, which absolutely yeah. is textbook the way of working but you were surprised at how many other agency leaders, et cetera, yeah. were saying, we just start. And the observation you've made is so apt for what we're talking about. That's where the, the scope creep starts. Mm -hmm. So lovely point. And like you said, a change order is just an opportunity to expand the account. So making that kind of shift in thinking about, I think two points very well made. So let's talk about the the kickoff has happened with the client and we're into the, the daily rhythm. How do the team keep in contact and keep each other updated? Who leads, who takes the call from the client? Like, how do you work it out? Yep. Um, 
I'm so glad, Lindsay, that you think I've learned my lesson because I, um, before you came on board, I mean, it, it was that, it was completely that, Jenny. I, we would start work right away and then they would take stuff out of the contract and be like, well, we did it. So um, I'm, I'm glad I've reformed and changed my ways. I mean, I think the point too about PMs being um, boundary coaches is really true in our work and our personal lives. Poor Lindsay has a lot to deal with as, as a peer. Um, but yeah, so how does the day-to-day -day work? We, it depends. We collaborate as much as we can. We use Slack heavily. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. um, conversation. We have often account channels, sometimes even project specific channels. If we have really distinct work happening at different places with an account. Um, and so there's a lot of conversation there, um, depending on the type of work we're doing, the stakeholders we're supporting, we might have internal check-ins, which is a really quick 15, 30 minute call with our internal team to make sure we're all on the same page. But that might happen weekly, it might happen bi-weekly, might happen monthly, it sort of depends on what's happening with the client. Um, we at Brilliant Inc. have been remote for I used to say five years, probably close to six now. It's been a very long time mm -hmm. of us working remote. It was far before COVID. Um, and yeah. so we have some ways of working that have um, really supported us through this increased uh, remote time. Um, and, and that's jumping on Zooms. It's jumping on the phone. It's having Slack conversations, being really open um, and available to get on the phone and talk through anything that might come up. But that's what it typically looks like. We have regular internal syncs. And then often we have um, syncs with our clients as well. Our project managers typically join those calls. It's very rare for them not to. Um, and part of that is so that we have all those different perspectives hearing what our clients are sharing. But we also try mm -hmm. to be really efficient with their time and not have 15 people on a call and all build the client for the time. So it's just always a balance of, how can we be the most efficient and do the smartest work for you? Sometimes that means having people in the room and um, instead of having one call with one person and then that person has to go and have 15 conversations okay. with 15 different people, that's actually not efficient. So um, it's typically through Slack and through internal and client check-ins that we sort of manage the work on an ongoing basis. And do you always make sure that everyone has a role to play in that meeting? Or would there be an, a scenario where the project manager maybe is kind of sitting there listening? Do you have that or do you do you make sure that everyone sort of has an active role so that the client sees that everyone's engaged? Yeah, we make sure that everyone has a role. Um, often the project manager will be the one who is has helped us schedule the meeting we'll send notes as a follow-up and action items mm -hmm. any updates to the project plan so while they may and of course we always ask their opinion as we're talking through timelines mm -hmm. and making sure we're not getting ourselves into trouble by over committing um that's sort of their role on the call they also have a huge role to play in the follow-up after the call mm -hmm. um but but yeah i mean we want to make sure that anyone who has joined has a question or two, has a role to play, has something to contribute to the conversation so that the client actually does feel like they're being supported by a team, not just one person with a bunch of people watching it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, Lindsay, from your perspective, does the project manager sort of make, make they take ownership of the action items, for example, that's coming out of a meeting to make sure that everything gets followed up on and the account manager doesn't sort of forget about something or not because there's I I mean when I started years ago and I'm a di dinosaur we had a very rigid <laughs> process to to have a contact report that had to go out within 24 hours of any client meeting no matter mm. what was said on that meeting and it was a very rigid process so what what's your you know after a client call what does everyone do does everyone understand what everyone has to do after that right right so I would say that we have a more flexible process than what you just described. I would also say that the word we often hear, if there's ever a description of how we work is collaborative. So when that client call is done, the project manager will likely take the lead to draft what they captured and heard in by way of key decisions, action items, and who they believe is taking the lead on those action items. And because we have a lot of clarity around roles and responsibilities, I would say that the project manager 
oversees that those things get done, but we have a lot of accountability for the folks in the different positions that they drive their own actions and next steps forward. And so as Sarah mentioned, we use Slack. It's organized by different client channels and by different project streams. We have a lot of Slack advocates that help us use threads and pinning and saved items to keep everything really well organized. And we use that tool to collaborate. What does this follow-up look like? Is it a long one? Is it a short one? Is it you know heavily detailed? Is it going to include deliverables that they need to review? Is it going to include questions that we need them to respond on? That sort of thing. And that is a team effort to get that out before the project manager, likely sometimes the account lead sends that over. Great. So they're not chivying people along. This is everyone takes accountability. They oversee kind of the, the capturing of the notes. As soon as everyone's assumed their responsibility for taking an action, then it's up to the individual to take those actions, essentially. You got it. Right. Okay. Um, let's say you're working on a, a longer term basis, retainer basis, and the client has an additional project they want to brief in. The briefing process, does the PM and the AM always attend every briefing call? No, it depends. Um, we might pull in, it depends on the nature of the work and who is able to best speak to that. Um, sometimes the project manager may join. Sometimes uh, it may be pulling the sales team back in or an expert, maybe it's a research project. And so we pull in someone from our research team so that we can really identify um, what's happening. We would be more likely to include the lead strategist that's on it. So the person who's responsible for the account management to make sure that they're hearing everything. Um, but then as the work progresses, we would pull the project manager in and as it sort of solidifies as an opportunity, we would mm -hmm. we would pull them in and and ask their opinion too of how do you feel about adding this to our current scope? Should we have a distinct um, SOW? Is this, while we have this long standing retainer, should this be a project? Um, and a fixed fee project that we handle differently with a separate budget and a separate timeline. So the project manager would be looped in then to help us with those decisions. Right. So they're really involved in pricing. I've just looked at the yeah. time, time girls and I cannot believe the time has just gone like this. I want to be respectful <laughs> of your time, but I'm also conscious. I've got to ask you both a final question because I okay. know there's going to be both account managers, project managers, agency owners listening to this waiting for your advice because you've been doing this for so long what would your advice be for an agency that's considering moving from a hybrid account manager to separating these teams you want to go ahead outside of do it like outside of make the change <laughs> <laughs> just repeat what uh, you you know you just speak from the heart Lindsay because you yeah. said something amazing <laughs> last time <laughs> So I think, I think my advice would be to start slow. Um, as I was thinking about um, talking to you and Sarah today, I was thinking about our evolution over the past five and a half, five and a half years since I've been here. And I was the first part-time project manager when I joined. And now we have several full-time and an entire consultant group that supports us. So we have multiple people within our PMO, but that took time. That didn't happen overnight. And um, for all the things we mentioned earlier, culturally, it is a shift. You add a new function, you add a new support group, and that takes time to get used to. So slowly add them to your team. Um, pick the right projects that need the most support so you can start really um, realizing the benefit and seeing the results and then build from there. Um, if you don't have them right now, let's not rush into it. Let's just take it slow is my advice. Great advice. What about you, Sarah? I, I would say that the benefit of freeing up brain space can't be underestimated. Mm. Um, sure, someone could do it all of course, um, but they can't do it all at the same level and not mm -hmm. everyone has the same skill set. And so I think having the humility to understand where your time is best used and to really understand where you might be okay at something, but someone else can do it at a whole nother level and welcoming that collaboration is really freeing. So for me, as someone who's really focused on account management and delivering awesome work, 
I need the space. I need the mental space to be able to focus on those tasks with my clients. And that's enough. That's a lot. I can't be in the weeds, managing timelines, managing scopes, managing contracts, delivering all this billable work, and also mm -hmm. thinking about building a long-term relationship and taking the time to go to lunch with my client and doing all of these things that take a considerable amount of time, checking in on their kids, seeing what's happening with them personally, those things that really build strong relationships, I can't do it all. And so that has been a huge benefit um, to our agency is just breaking up those tasks so that people can have a little mm -hmm. bit of mental space to do the work that they're really good at really well. Very well said, very well said, and obviously spoken from the heart. So thank you so much. And in fact, thank you both so, so much because you've really shared some gems today. Thank Honestly, I've taken loads of notes and I'm sure people listening will have too. So Thank you both for joining me. It, this has been an absolute pleasure and we're just on the hour. So that's an hour in total. So thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you, Jenny. Jenny.